Welcome to the UChem tutorial on naming, or sometimes called nomenclature in chemistry, um, by example. So what I'm going to do with this series of videos is give you some examples and the rules of naming. In this one, what I'm going to start with is identifying different types of chemical compounds. So in chemistry, there are three main types of compounds. And it's very important to be able to identify the main types of compounds because the rules of naming apply with each type of compound. So there's a different type of rule for each type of compound. If you don't know what kind of compound you're dealing with, you may apply the wrong rules and name it improperly. So the best way to begin naming is to know what kind of compound you're dealing with, and then you can go ahead and name each type. There will be further videos on each type of compound showing you how to name each type. So let's start with the types of compounds. There are three. There are ionic compounds, molecular compounds, and acids. So I'm going to begin with ionic compounds over there on the left, and I just want to give you an example. So this is potassium chloride, and as I say the name potassium chloride, I see the symbols potassium and chlorine there. And the name, the spoken name, potassium chloride, gives me a hint that this is an ionic compound because of the type of way that I say that. And we'll get to that when we start talking about the written name or the spoken name of this compound, potassium chloride. If I look at the symbols, potassium chloride, potassium and chlorine, and then I dissect that compound apart, what I'll find is a potassium ion, that positively charged potassium, and a chloride ion, that Cl minus. So I have a positive and a negative charge piece that is a characteristic of an ionic compound. These are compounds that are held together with charge-charge interactions. So when I'm dissecting or trying to identify ionic compounds, I look for the positively charged species written first and the negatively charged thing written um, next. Now to find these pieces, what I do is I use my knowledge of the periodic table and I know that metals generally form positively charged ions. Non-metals form negatively charged ions. So a big hint that I have an ionic compound is if I have a a metal and then a non-metal. Now there are exceptions to this. There are some um, groups of non-metals that have positive charges. But the one common thing about ionic compounds is you have the element or elements that are positively charged, those are always written first, and then the element or groups of elements that are negatively charged are written next. So you're looking for positive and negative charges, and generally that involves a metal first and then non-metals after that. There are exceptions, so I'm giving a little caveat there, but those are few. Um, and so in general, if you see a metal first and then non-metals after that, you're generally looking for an looking at an ionic compound. So let me give you one more example so you can see a more complicated ionic compound. This is iron sulfate and this is an iron 3 sulfate so the name has a lot of information within it but just looking at the symbol for this and trying to identify this as an ionic compound. So if I take a look at the first elements there what I see is iron, and the little subscript means there's two of those, and then in parentheses I see a group of nonmetals, and there are three of those groups, that's what the parentheses mean. So let's break this apart a little bit. What I see are two irons, and those irons have a plus three charge. When we get into the, the video on naming ionic compounds, I'll show you how I know that. And then I see three, that's what that little subscript means, three of those groups of nonmetals, and that SO4, those nonmetals, have as a group a negative two charge. That group is called sulfate, and I know that it has a negative two charge because I've memorized that sulfate, that group of nonmetals, it's a commonly found group of nonmetals, it has a minus two charge overall. And later on you'll learn how I know that, how I can figure that out, but usually we find these common groups, they're called polyatomic ions, and you need to memorize the common ones and the, co the charges of these common ions. So that's something to put as a thing on your to-do list in chemistry, is to make sure you know the names, the formulas, and the charges for those polyatomic ions. 
So when I put together my positively charged metal and my group of negatively charged nonmetals, I form my ionic compound. So this is an example of a more complicated ionic compound. But again, it's pretty easy to see that there are two pieces there. Okay, the metal piece, that plus charge piece, and the non-metal piece, the negatively charged piece. A cationic piece, positively charged, an anionic piece, negatively charged. Now, let's move along to the molecular compounds and the acids. And what I find in a molecular compound is something different than an ionic compound. Molecular compounds involve the sharing of electrons between non-metals. So if I look at the compound here, CCl4 or carbon tetrachloride, what I see is something that is composed of all nonmetals, and that's the hallmark of molecular compounds. Here's another example. You don't just have to have two kinds of nonmetals in your compound. Here we have C6H12O6, and that is going to be a compound of glucose. So we can have a group of nonmetals being very large, a group of nonmetals being small. If it's all nonmetals, we're looking at a molecular compound. Now, the last group here, the acids, is a subset of the molecular compounds, actually. Um, and we, these are special because they always have the same kind of formula. They always have the hydrogens first. And acids are these compounds that when they go into water, those hydrogens are released and they form acidic solutions. So we segregate them from molecular compounds. We write their formulas in a special way, having the hydrogen first, and we name them in a special way, and that's why I've broken them off. All right, so now that we have these three main compounds, I wanna, I've wanna i shown you examples. Now I want to give you a general form for each type. So let's go ahead and take a look at the ionic compounds. All right, I have a cation and an anion. And then if I have a molecular compound, I have a group of nonmetals. If I look at the acids, I have a hydrogen first, always in the formula, and then nonmetals. So if you can remember these little summaries of ionic, molecular, and acid, um, these categories, then you can have a picture in your mind of what each type of compound looks like and what you need to look for when you are examining a molecular formula. So let's do that. Let's examine some molecular formulas and try to decide which category they belong in. So I have some examples. It would be helpful for you to write these down and perhaps pause the video at this time, work on those, try to categorize them on their own, and then when you're ready, you can replay the video, just press play, and then I'll reveal the answers. All right, so I'm moving ahead, and what I'm doing for the first one here, I'm looking at CF4, and in CF4, I'm looking at all nonmetals, so I have a molecular compound. In the second compound, I have a hydrogen first. That's that big clue, we have an acid. In the next compound, I have calcium, and then I have that SO4, that sulfate, which I remember being one of those negatively charged polyatomic anions. So I have a cation that is a metal that's calcium and an anion sulfate, so I have an ionic compound. The next one is has iron and bromine in it. Iron is a metal, so I know that forms positively charged ions, and then bromine is a nonmetal. I know those those halogens, that's what bromine its category on the periodic table is a halogen. These form negatively charged ions. And so I look if I look at that I say, oh plus and minus, so I have what I what I can categorize as an ionic compound. All right, so you can do a lot more practice with this. You can go ahead and go out there and look at some formulas. Every time you look at a formula, immediately in your head, you should pop in a category, molecular, acid, ionic. And if you can categorize them, then it makes naming a lot easier. So do a lot of practice with that first, and then you can start to apply your rules of naming for each type.